Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Nasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to you, the blessed noble and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed noble and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Saranto Suchedoye Olahudi Samyao Sampatoshi. Namo Sadanto Sutedoye Halahadi Samyao Samputo Se Mushang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Chien Wan Jin and Zhao Yi Wu Jin Jian Wan the Shou Shi Yan Jie Rulai Jian Shi Yi Supreme and Wondrous Dharma, Subtle and Profound, Rarely is encountered even in billions of eons, but now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Hung Shur. Today is Sunday, June 20th here in the Gold Coast of Queensland. We're almost at the winter solstice. Uh, it is Saturday night, June the 19th in the US and Father's Day is upon us. This is also uh, the day that we observe the official uh, Nirvana day of our teacher, Master Shren Hua. So we have multiple observances happening today. We're here to look into the Flower Garland Sutra. And I would like to use a simple melody to invite the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Assembly to come to where we are, wherever you are. Uh, we'll ask them to spread their light around the planet and uh, make the, as they say, the big disasters become little and make the little disasters go away, right? Okay, here we go. Here's our, this is the melody that we use. Thank you. 
it's an attempt to bring the sutra to life and to put some cultural relevance in what can be a kind of a culture bound phenomena called lecturing on sutras. So that's what we're about here. We're going down to page 90. There we go, page 90 right there. Hide the thumbnails. <coughs> what we're about to do is look into some verses of sutra, words the Buddha spoke, called the Flower Garland Sutra. And we're in the chapter known as the Shridipi, in the 10 stages, the 10 grounds. Um, we're in the verses portion of ground stage number 10. And which says we're at the end of this chapter. We're almost there. Um, only have a couple, a handful of verses to go before, we, uh, before we're finished. So uh, let me give you a quick summary of, of what we're talking about. Then we're going to use the Chinese language, which you're seeing on the page there, to uh, recite today's text. And we'll translate that in English. And then we'll say a few words about uh, what, uh, what it might mean. We're going to try to, to interpret it and make it come alive and relevant to our lives. This is the story of the Bodhisattva, the awakened being. And it's an instruction manual. It's a how-to. These are every bit as uh, meant to be put into uh, practice as the white folded printout that you get with your Ikea coffee table, right? Or for me, I just got a, a new vacuum cleaner, haha. And the vacuum cleaner booklet was printed in Germany. It's got 10 languages, very clever. The, Instructions repeat, 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 and they refer to figures. And you turn to the back of the book and you flip out the photographs, which are the figures. So one set of figures, 10 kinds of languages. Very well done, very, very Germanic, excellent, precise. So the Abhatamsaka Sutra's 10 stages chapter is that. It's that clever, well laid out, uh, time honored method for turning an ordinary person like us, ordinary people like us into bodhisattvas. It's very pragmatic. That's just what it is. It's a handbook. It's a how-to. So we have walked with the bodhisattva through every step of the way. We're now at the very peak, the pinnacle of his progress or her progress. The bodhisattva has in this 10th stage called the Fa Yundi, the cloud of Dharma, the stage of the Dharma cloud. At this point, the Bodhisattva has been initiated. He's been consecrated. He's had uh, sweet dew or ambrosia or chrism in the Chinese, in the, the Catholic language, um, lexicon of the Roman Catholicism. Uh, it could be water. It could be oil. It could be oil with herbs in it or scent or spices, something special that is placed on the crown of the head, of the bodhisattva, and he, she becomes, they call it shi wei pusa, someone who has been appointed to the, who has ascended to the, the role, ascended to the position, to the job, to the duty, to the uh, stage of Dharma prince, one who is about to become the Dharma king, the Buddha. Above this, in terms of education, there is nothing higher. This is the Bodhisattva's jump off point. He is or she is at that edge of the platform about to hear his or her name read. And they walk across the platform and get their diploma and flip their tassel. Maybe the tassel on the mortar board, the graduation hat is a reference to this anointing of the crown, something to do with the head from this side to that side. You're a graduate. You are now an alumna, alumni. It's, who knows? Maybe, you know, it's, it's interesting cultural crossover there. Somebody can make that their dissertation topic. So that's where we are. And further, the, the way our sutra is laid out is first, there are verse, there are prose lines. First, it's text, right? Then after the text is done, 
you go back to the beginning and say it all again in verse form with meter. Bum, 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 bum. So we're in the meters, we're in the verses, the repetitive verses that lay out the accomplishment of the Bodhisattva. And because we just had this dramatic phenomenon of the Bodhisattva being christened on the crown of his head and a lotus flower appears. Look at my screen here. This may well be something similar to the lotus. This is an actual photograph of an actual lotus that grows right here at the Gold Coast Dumber Realm. Something that perfect and splendid uh, came out of nature, came right out of that muddy water in the pot. And I was there with my camera. So maybe uh, I, I didn't look to see if there was a Buddha sitting in the middle. I guess I should have looked twice here, but that's what happens when the Bodhisattva ascends to the position and accepts the appointment to the position of Dharma Prince. He's ready to go. He's, he's the next Buddha to be at this point. And the, uh, the, the thing that happens next is the lotus appears, the Bodhisattva takes his seat on the lotus and Buddhas, it's in great numbers around the Dharma realm, all applaud, say, well done, well done. We were there, we know what it's like. You are the new one. It's a wonderful accomplishment that you have that you've realized. So well done, they say. And uh, the Bodhisattva uh, next emits light. Light comes out of the crown of his head and it circles around and it enters into the soles of the feet of all the Buddhas. Um, interesting how that works. That's what happens. Then following that, a light comes out of the crown of his head and shines on Buddha, Buddha's Dharma assemblies in all 10 directions, signifying indeed through this communication by light. You know, if we saw it, if we saw it in a Disney film, we might recognize it. If we saw it uh, in a video game, we might recognize it. The fact that it's actually happening in our supra mundane reality here uh, is because we've never seen it. It's never been put on the screen. So it's like, really? That happens. That's amazing. That's just amazing, right? So this is our, this is where we plug in today in this process of the spectacular. Uh, in French, they say, le son et la lumière, right? The sound and the light. The phenomena that happen when a bodhisattva jung shirdi wait realizes this stage of the tenth the tenth stage all right are we good that's where we were let's tune in now and look at our text okay We are. All right, here's the Chinese. Shi Fang Fu Sa Lai Guan Cha. Now, what we're doing, we're chanting, right? So I'll give you a line, you chant it. Shi Fang Fu Sa Lai Guan Cha. Shi Fang Fu Sa Lai Guan Cha. Shou Zhi Da Shi Shu Guang Zhao. Ten directions, bodhisattvas, come to gaze at this great hero. Ten directions, bodhisattvas, come to gaze at this great hero. Those who've received the appointment, send forth radiance. Those who've received the appointment, send forth radiance. Buddhas also emit lights from between their eyebrows. Buddhas also emit lights from between their eyebrows. Those lights shine on every side, then enter the crown of his head. Those lights shine on every side, then enter the crown of his head. 
more light talking. Um, bodhisattvas from 10 directions come to visit and look at and celebrate the new graduate, the new success story. And those who've received the appointment among the bodhisattvas and also the Buddhas, uh, the, six, the successors from the 10th stage, those who proceeded successively, successively, successfully, successively uh, from the 10th stage also send out light. And from between the eyebrows, the Meijian spot, one of the, this is one of the, the uh, 32 hallmarks of the Maha Purusha, the great hero, the Dajang Fu in Chinese. Uh, when a Buddha becomes a Buddha, his reward body expresses these 32 hallmarks and the 80 subtle characteristics, right? So this white hair tuft between the eyebrows is one of those. And from that place comes light. And those lights shine on all sides and then enter the crown of the head of the Bodhisattva. So at this point, something profound has happened. Okay, is this too weird? Is this like out there? People haven't imagined something like this? Maybe in your dreams, um, on a particularly clear, happy night of dreaming, you from a distance visualize something like this? Who's to say? I mean, you just wish some talented artist, someone who is good with um, animation tools, right? Could take this sequence of events and plot it out so that people could have a reference because it is profoundly spectacular. This Buddhas and Bodhisattvas communicating with each other, sending out lights that then enter different parts of the body. And, and that's just the visual part. But can you imagine how that feels to receive light from the Buddhas that, you know, touches the crown of your head and enters your body? It must be uh, blissful. Do we have language that captures that? It must be uh, beyond expression. Too fine a feeling to have this sense of being gathered in, accepted, and launched uh, by the Buddhas. Right. All right, this is truly, what is this? Mahayana Dharma. This is Abhatamsaka Sutra Dharma. Um, the Sharangama, the Sharangama Sutra is, talks about Da Fo Ding, Shou Lang Yan Jing, the Sutra of the, the in, indestructible Sutra of the Buddha's magnificent crown of his head, right? The summit of the Buddha's head has it in a title similar things going on, but in the Avatamsaka, when you add an S to Buddha and it's Buddhas and it's Buddhas of 10 directions, right? So you think 10 directions, including above and below, just what could be finer, right? So instead of, if you remember, what was the last time you jumped in a pool of water? Swimming pool, lake, deep creek, so that you really plunged in and the water surrounded you on all sides. Remember that feeling? Any of us have had that feeling recently? Jumping in a, a uh, safe, all-encompassing body of water. Right? So water touches every centimeter, every inch of your skin. Imagine now, swap out that water for light. And it's light generated from the good nature of another awakened sage, right? How that must feel. It's blissful and uh, surpassing transcendent. Is that possible? Can you surpass transcendence? Yeah, it, language really fails. I, you know, my imagination, I can sort of visualize. Um, one thing I could bring to it is, um, I live on a, the lee side of the hill. I'm in the shadow side of a small, not, it's not a mountain, it's a small hill. And uh, so the sun has already risen 
um, by an hour or so when it finally crests the hill behind my house and starts to shine down. And before that happens, somehow from about 4 a.m. on is always the coldest part of, of the night is the early morning. And there's a chill. There's definitely a chill that touches your bones. And then that sun breaks through and those first rays come down and I and the birds all go for the sunlight. <laughs> I just see the birds landing and then uh, stretching out their wings and catching the sun's rays. And me too, I stretch out my wings and catch those sun rays. And the, the feeling of the sun on chilled skin uh, is so joyous, right? Ah, you know, you feel like your skin is drinking in that light. Well, that's, I'm on planet Earth and the sun is out there in our solar system. And imagine if the Buddha were there beside you or from whatever world, distance kind of shrinks here. And it's Buddha's nature light shining on you, how that must feel. Yeah. All right, what happens next? Okay, artist, artist of the imagination. If you actually can do it with CGI or if you have a uh, animation program, go for it. Here we go. Shi fang shi jie xian zhen dong yi qie shi fang shi jie yi zhen dong yi qie di yu ku xiao mie yi qie di yu ku xiao mie shi shi zhu fo yu qi zhi shi shi zhu fo yu qi zhi ru zhuan lun wang di yi zi ru zhuan lun wang World systems of the ten directions move and quake. World systems of the ten directions move and quake. The sufferings in the hells completely cease. Sufferings in the hells completely cease. Just then the Buddhas consecrate him. Just then the Buddhas consecrate him as the firstborn son of a wheel turning monarch. As the firstborn son of a wheel turning monarch. The next thing that happens in our menu of amazing Buddhist events, Buddha event, Buddha making events, is earthquakes. <laughs> the earthquakes. Right? The earthquakes in six different ways. And we looked into the, when we did the prose, we looked into them. Three of those six quakes are movement. Three of them are sound. Um, when was your last earthquake? Anybody, anybody raise their hand? Uh, it's not the case that you get earthquakes everywhere. Unless, unless, your local natural gas company has been fracking, right? With the advent of fracking so that we don't have to pay a little more at the gas pump so that we can drive our SUVs. Uh, people inject hot steam into previously stable and firm ground where earthquakes were not part of the historical record and the earthquakes, right? So we can drive our gas guzzlers. In the Bay Area, in San Francisco, uh, we live surrounded by faults because we're at the edge of the continent. And uh, one of those, the Hayward Fault, <laughs> goes directly under the football stadium of the University of California, Berkeley. Yes, it does. And then it proceeds right up uh, Euclid Avenue. Yes, it does. At one point, we were looking for uh, a place for Berkeley Buddhist Monastery back in 1994 uh, at the direction of, of Master Hua of Shifu. And uh, we found a realtor who said, oh, we got a house up there in Euclid for you. So we went up and looked at this house and it's directly on the Hayward Fault. And we 
went down into the basement. Sure enough, the basement wall like that, where it was just a, nudged a little bit, you know, and it was enough to crack the basement. And we said, mm, maybe not. Maybe we'll let this one go. So um, the Hayward Fault is, is right there. And of course, the San Andreas, we've heard about the San Andreas Fault. There are other uh, faults that are uh, more or less active. I remember one month, uh, three or four years ago, when there was a cluster of earthquakes, a swarm of earthquakes in, in Berkeley. None of them went over like, I think 2.3 was the worst one, which is in terms of seismology, that's a pretty uh, gentle earthquake, but there was a bunch of them. I think there were 13 quakes in a short period of time. And they were all like little, hmm. and it's that moment where something's going boom, 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 boom. and it is both movement and sound. And you think, uh oh, this shouldn't be moving. And it is. Well, there is do a little bit of advertising for the Exploratorium. Uh, San Francisco has a very cool museum called the Exploratorium over near Golden Gate Park. And they have all kinds of imaginative, clever, creative uh, experiments going on. It's very interactive. So for kids and the kid in you, uh, go check out the Exploratorium. One of their ex exhibits, uh, their experiments that you could mess with was an earthquake tester. And they get you into a little cage and everybody instructions hang on tight. And then you can ask to experience the shaking of various famous earthquakes. <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. And they have the uh, Dangshan earthquake from China. And they have the, the 1908 earthquake, San Francisco. And they have the earthquake in set off the Banda Aceh tsunami and various things. And man, oh man, uh, there, you know, you hang on tight and this platform shakes and then you get to experience what it's like. And they also play the sounds that happen. And the sounds for sure are uh, coming from the buildings around you, but the earth itself makes noise. And so when the Bodhisattva accepts the appointment to his next position. Um, the earth quakes in six ways, and there is no harm. Nobody, nobody dies. There's no property damage. That's the marvel of it. Um, my personal favorite, unfavorite earthquake story was after uh, Taiwan's Chiu R E Da Di Zhen the September 21st earthquake back in 1989. And uh, uh, I traveled with a Bhikshu Hanglu to, to Taiwan eight days after this major, major earthquake hit the center of the country around Uli and Taichung area. And uh, we got off the airplane at CCK airport and drove into Taipei to our building, the Taipei Fajie, which is a 14-floor, 14 14-story 14 high-rise. And as soon as we entered and sat down to get the report from uh, Mr. Chun and, and the others, an aftershock hit that was uh, 6.3, 6.4. And the, the major earthquake, I think, was 6.8 or something. And these aftershocks were not quite as powerful, but almost. And the building went to the limits of its tensile strength and it sang. The building went like that. And we're, everybody's grabbing onto whatever you can grab onto as the building sings to you. So, ah, and then it went back and it happened again right afterwards. These were aftershocks a week after the major earthquake. So, yeah, that was, it's, it's not supposed to do that. Buildings aren't supposed to sing. They're supposed to be mute, right? And boy, oh boy. Uh, so when world systems of the 10 directions move and quake, you can imagine 
that the goodness of, so, so what's going on? You know, how can there be a harmless earthquake? Earthquakes are supposed to be destructive and scary, right? Yeah, mostly, for sure they are indeed. Oh boy, that Taiwan earthquake, uh, September 21st uh, killed 7,000 people and countless. And the other thing about tragic earthquakes like that are the PTSD, the trauma uh, that, that disorders people is profound. Uh, dogs, cats, infants, and adults uh, are, because the ground is supposed to be stable. The planet's supposed to be stable, even though it's not. And uh, so that takes, there was lots and lots of trauma recovery. And that's something, if indeed uh, we have seismic events coming up in our, in our future, um, be sensitive to people's emotional and mental needs, right? It's just, uh, it's, it's a shock. So not only are Buddhist earthquakes auspicious earthquakes, which every sutra talks about, are, not only are they not traumatic, but they're delightful, people say. There's their source of joy, even with the noise and the shaking. Beyond the earthquakes, the sufferings in the hells completely cease. Okay? There is, now is, ask the question, how is this possible? Come on, how, how come uh, everything that terrifies ordinary folks is instead delightful. How does that work? How can that be possible? And my answer is, this is not outside of cause and effect. Cause and effect is the engine of the universe. Nothing, the, nothing in this success, we're at the top of the ladder, right? This is the success story of of a bodhisattva's journey, the hero's journey. Um, nothing in the Dharma falls outside of cause and effect. So this is still goodness at work. This is what you call sheng, bunda, sublime merit and virtue. Why don't we know about it? It's because we don't get there very often there are not enough people becoming Buddhas for this to be a common occurrence. So to say, I don't know about it, therefore it doesn't exist. That's to inflate the realm of your own knowledge, right? So just think about how many languages we don't speak and you get humble real quick, right? How many, for me, my biggest, intellectual downfall. <laughs> Let's see, how do we rank those? One of my biggest intellectual downfalls is an inability with math and quantities. It's never any good at patiently holding this variable and then interacting with the other variable. Couldn't do that. Uh, so, so much I don't know. I'm going to suggest that Buddhist auspicious earthquakes, auspicious Buddhist earthquakes and the cause and effect in one of the realms called the hells being shadow overshadowed over being having the shadows that cloak the hells and the suffering there ripped apart by this incredible light and goodness is a predictable phenomenon. This is not outside the realm of cause and effect. So it's just so good. Right, that there's a celebration. Um, we can point. There's there's folklore. What if, what does folklore say? Folklore says, whenever there is a major battle in a war, a battlefield, for seven years, the cycle of crops are knocked out of natural rotation. That when humans go to war and slaughter each other and destroy the land. The uh, descriptions of the Somme, S-O-M-M-E, um, 
the battlefield in France, and that led to the uh, the, the, the Germans pushing the Allied troops. America wasn't there yet, and pushing the British and French and Belgian and Canadian troops across the ground and out to Dunkirk, um, evacuation and all. Those, the, the descriptions of trench warfare in World War I and what followed is completely in that, in that scope, right? Uh, Every blade of grass, every tree, every animal was destroyed in the process of war. And the result was fallow, right? Things didn't grow. They say that's folklore. The case or not, that's negative, extremely negative cause and effect. So how often do we do extremely positive cause and effect? Maybe if we had more holy good deeds, we would come to expect holy, good, like entirely good results and nature's rejoicing. Right? Ancient sages said, Tian di ren, heaven, nature, you could say, humanity, and then the earth were completely linked. And when any one of those three layers, the san cai, they're called the three talents, the three uh, vital uh, living organisms of the heavens, the earth, and humanity, when one of them does an outstanding job, the other two report it, register it, right? The ripples go out. So do a really good deed and watch how your family responds, right? When we see uh, YouTube videos of humanity doing something wholesome, you can tear up. It's just so good, you know. What did I saw? I saw the dodo. I told you that I'm a great fan of the dodo uh, animal videos on YouTube. And the one I saw recently was a Mitchell's python. No, it, because it's not. It, uh, pythons aren't venomous. A Mitchell's viper uh, in India had fallen down a well. And it was halfway down this deep well in a crevice where it was all caught in there because as soon as it came out, it would go into the water. So it wound its way up halfway up, but it couldn't go any further. And some brave individual was lowered down by his teammates and got in there with the snake hook and the net. And the snake did indeed fall in the water. He followed it down to the to top of the water in the well and fished it out. And, and then the snake was trying to get away and he got him into the net and they all were pulled up and they released it into the wild. And it was just wonderful to see that a human cared enough for the life of this very venomous viper snake and saved it just because of kindness, right? You go, ah, oh, good, it's good. So when somebody becomes a Buddha or does all that work, all that uh, focused, sustained, patient work that the marketplace doesn't celebrate, right? You decide you're not going to eat meat. You're not going to drink. Some of your friends will call you a loser, right? Like, what, guys, where's the fun in life? All you Buddhists, it's all suffering all the time, right? No, it's just, I'm not going to poison myself with alcohol and, and food that I wasn't meant to digest. Right. And right, so a lot of the world doesn't celebrate what a bodhisattva values. And this person has done so, has put up with the, lo the loss of popularity, you could say, becoming a wallflower, becoming a loser, all the words teetotaler, you know, no fun, all that, because they have tasted the joy of liberation and they, their eyes include all living beings and wish to no, no longer harm them, right? So for that, now the rewards come in at the end of the path, which is the sufferings of the hells completely cease. And the Buddhas consecrate him as the firstborn son of a wheel-turning monarch, a Chakravartin. Yeah, wheel-turning monarchs, by golly.
Um, I have actually, I've got a story of the hell is completely ceasing. This is one of those, one of those stories. Um, I told it before, but it bears retelling. Um, I was at the International Translation Institute, ITI, in Burlingame. And this must have been um, 1990, let's see, 92, maybe. And uh, Master Hua was, was upstairs in his apartments. He was on the third floor. And uh, he called down and he on the phone and said, well, John, come get this newspaper and take it back. So I went upstairs, grabbed the newspaper, took it back down, and shared it with the other monks. And it was a story. It was, a, I think it was the Shi Jie Erba. It was the World Journal in Chinese, but it was telling the story of an event that happened in Germany. And the event in Germany was a taxi driver who had died and gone to purgatory and then the hells and then returned back to humanity. So it was a story of near death experience, right? Born again, but it all happened within a couple of days. And luckily, <laughs> luckily in his town in Germany, uh, it was a weekend and they couldn't take him to the mortuary and get him embalmed and ready to bury him. He uh, had stayed, stayed uh, in the, uh, uh, what, in the cold storage or something. So they hadn't, they hadn't done anything to the corpse because why? He opened his eyes again and woke up and his family witnessed it and was like, ah, you're back. Well, where were you? Why, why did you, did you die? Are you, are you a ghost? Right. So he told his story and the story was picked up, reported in a German newspaper and picked up by the World Journal because in his story, he described Earth Store Bodhisattva. And he said, yeah, he said, I, these uh, two tall robed figures with tall black hats showed up. And they said, time for you to go. And he, he says, I didn't want to go and I had no choice. I just was kind of lifted out for my body and I traveled with them. They, they had no choice. I had no voice in it. And I traveled with them. And he said, we crossed over a river and there was a black dog there. And suddenly I heard the smells, the sounds, heard, smelled the smells, heard the sounds, and felt the feeling of despair. And there was a big tall wall, and we crossed right through the gate inside this kind of city fort, fortress city. And suddenly, the from down below, he said, underneath our feet were these awful screams and cries and wails. And worst of all was just the feeling, just this, the, the vibe there, which was desperation and no hope, hopelessness. Um, and he said, I saw the, I came before this judge, he said. And the judge looked at me, said, what is your name? I said my name and he said, you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> and he told the, the warden there, he says, you got the wrong one, send him back. But since you are here, you get a tour, he said. And this, this is a taxi driver. This is a man who, you know, he's not intellectually processing this. He's reporting what happened to it. And he's terrified, you know. So he says, the... Uh, the two figures with the tall black hats, just one of them now, didn't need to. The other one said very bureaucratic. The other one went, went away. But the one figure with the tall black hat took him into 
a place where he said it was like an ocean, like a sea. And there were many, 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 many people, humans, recognizably humans, who were being pushed and herded like sheep with a sheepdog. They were being pushed and herded by these demons with pitchforks pushed into the water. And out of the water came these giant beasts like jaws, right? Great white sharks and, and uh, aquatic creatures who gobbled them, cut their bodies in half with their teeth, pulled them under the water, drowned them, bit, ate them. And of course the screams and cries were just unbearable. It was a horrifying, horrifying nightmare type event, he said. And then suddenly, he said, out of the sky, although they were clearly, it was, they were down in the ground, but up above, not the roof, because it wasn't a, it wasn't a man-made structure, but it was kind of like just the, the, the heaven or the sky. It's as if it split open and this figure came out. And the taxi driver in Germany said he was bald and he had a red robe on. And I'm going to move aside here so y'all, can you all see these on Pusa? We've got first store Bodhisattva right there behind me on this altar. He said he was wearing a red robe and he had a staff, like a, like a, kind of like a, anything. What else you call it? A staff. And he went chunk, chunk, chunk. And he banged it on the ground three times. And all the sounds of suffering stopped. They stopped. And he said the figure read out several names. And mine was included. He read my name. And he said the tall, black robed, black hatted figure who was with me just kind of pushed me. And I went up through the, the space being held by this red robed red, uh, the figure with the red sash that he was holding open along with several others. And we escaped, we traveled out through a gate and I woke up and I'm back. <laughs> and the reporter who was recording the story said, what happened next? And the taxi driver said, I really wanted to know who that was. Who was that figure? And he says, I, I have a classmate who said that was a Buddhist figure and I need to find out more about him. He said, but I'm glad to be here. <laughs> so that was Master Hua said, okay, do you all read that story? He said, you should have more faith in first or bodhisattva, he said, and hung up the phone, right? So it's like, oh, blah, 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 blah. yeah. Um, I lost track of that newspaper over the intervening years, but uh, because many Chinese readers of the World Journal, Shi Jie Bao, would have a cultural reference to Ursto Bodhisattva, even if they weren't Buddhist, right? They would kind of know who that was. So that's why the World Journal picked up the story from Germany. So near death experience and having this red robed bald figure with a staff come through the sky, bang, 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 and all the sounds of suffering ceased, right? So world systems of the 10 directions move and quake, the sufferings in the hells completely cease. Um, he, our storyteller didn't, didn't continue the story, um, but we can assume that as soon as the Bodhisattva stopped was done with his mission to pull out the mistakes, the bureaucratic errors that sent the taxi driver down there by mistake, um, that he disappeared and all the sounds of the hells resumed. You can assume that was the case. They didn't stop forever, but he had come down to pull out the souls whom he could, right? Then the Buddhas consecrate him as a firstborn son of a heel turning monarch. Yeah, yeah. How about that? So.
so, gee whiz. <laughs> when you hear stories like that, how do you, how do you contextualize them? How do you integrate them in your conscious awareness? Is that, do you just dismiss it? Do you like go, eh? No. We've seen so many movies. Anybody who's played video games has looked at or seen at least images, representations on the screen of demons and awful. We have a, a, a fascination with, uh, we have a fascination with zombies, right? With zombie apocalypse, these awful semi-human creatures. And then we shiver and then the movie's over and we're back to normal existence, right? So when you hear about the hells and something marvelous happening, something wonderful, like first door bodhisattva causing the sounds of the hells to quit, you know, what do you do with that? So, yeah. Anyway, that's our, our bodhisattva's phenomena, the, the ripples going out from our bodhisattvas being consecrated as the firstborn son of a wheel-turning monarch. Um, what's that like? Oh boy. Romong Zhu Fo Yu Guan Ding. Romong Zhu Fo Yu Guan Ding. Shi Zai Ming Dang Fa Yun Di. Shi Zai Ming Dang Fa Yun Di. Shi Hui Zang Zhang Wu Yu Bian. Shi Hui Zang Zhang Wu Yu Bian. Kai Wu Yi Che Zhu Shi Jian. Kai Wu. When the Buddhas anoint the crown of one's head, when the Buddhas anoint the crown of one's head, that is called ascending to the stage of the Dharma cloud. That is called ascending to the stage of the Dharma cloud. One's wisdom grows without limits. One's wisdom grows without limits. So he can comprehend all things in all worlds. So he can comprehend all things in all worlds. The Buddha is anointed the crown of the Bodhisattva's head, and he ascends to the stage of the Dharma cloud. Cloud of Dharma. One's wisdom grows without limits, so he can comprehend all things in all worlds. Um, <coughs> to we'll go into one door of this. A house of explanation that we've been building and talk about the um, if this were what we said because the reason we can't do more than kind of take a tour of this room is because it's opened it's a even lesser known part of this process which is the inner alchemy the inner yogic processes that can take place when somebody is an adept, when somebody's an advanced Buddhist yogi. And there's crossover to Taoist practices as well. And they say that the two meridians, the one that goes up the back of the body and the one that comes down the front, the Ren and the Du meridians, when they unite, when they connect, um, there is a real transformation of the cognitive processes, the way you know things, uh, what you can know, what's knowable to you inherently than from before. Um, if people are familiar with the, the alchemical and the shamanic image of a snake biting its own tail or holding its own tail in its mouth, making a circle, uh, Carl Jung looked into this aspect of shamanism then you kind of get a sense of how culture has dealt with this over the years. So if before knowledge was, we got knowledge by what, you know, reading it again and then reading it again, maybe memorizing it, maybe doing an exercise to kind of imprint it in our circuitry 
to take a tutorial course in it, to watch a, a video instruction, you know, whatever. How do we learn things? How do we, how do they become ours? Repetition, repetition, repetition all the time. The Bodhisattva now has got a connected flow of wisdom internally. And it's instead of having a uh, analog one-to-one -one sort of knowledge uptake, now there is a non-dual uh, knowledge uptake from single, from what do they call it? Uh, the truth that is based on duality, right, wrong, yes, no, true, false. Now there's an ultimate truth input that the Bodhisattva is able to uh, access. Okay, now that sounds funny. It sounds real stilted as I describe it, but uh, that's because it's, if anything, even less known than these other phenomena that happen. That doesn't mean unreal, doesn't mean false, doesn't mean um, mythological, right? That is to say, only in the realm of old stories, it's absolutely available and the case. It's just nobody does the work, okay? Um, one's wisdom grows without limits. You can comprehend all things in all worlds, by golly. Um, I wanted now to talk about wheel turning monarchs. Wheel turning monarchs. And I've got a, uh, let me pick this up here. There we are. More, please. Depending on my iCloud. Yes, there we are. So that him. Um, I'm going to pick up all of this. And mention, let's see, did we have, here we are. Notes, 10 stage notes. This is my document. All right, there we are, sliding down at the bottom. Ah, look how small. Oh. Okay. When we're talking about um, cultural phenomena, like we did, we talked about consecrating the crown of the head and how cultures worldwide had similar uh, ceremonies from the Roman Catholics anointing the crown of candidate for bishop and being raised to the rank of bishop or archbishop, right? And we talked about the images of Egyptian kings, Russian czars, uh, French kings, all going through a similar experience of having something put on the crown of the head. We had the Jain images of Mahavir. Disciples climb to the top of these gigantic statues and pour milk and, and ghee on the, the crown of the head. So clearly something is going on here that humanity affirms is a way to uh, signify somebody's now ascended to another stage, right? So among those beings whose progress, spiritual progress, temporal progress, spatial progress, um, received, requires this anointing of the crown. Among them are what are called the four kings of heaven, Siddhatinmo. They are in four directions in the Buddhist telling of it, but they also exist in other cultural stories of them. In the East, we have one called Dhritarashtra. He is known as the bodhisattva who upholds the nation, who holds the country, who sustains the country. 
and uh, he protects living beings in these countries, and he's called the Chirgo Tianwang. Uh, he, his realm is the east. He's the king of heaven to the east. And what's interesting is these devas, these gods, they're gods, they're devas, are in the heaven closest to the human realm, they say. So if you look up fast enough, you have to raise your head quickly. How do you do it? Oh, maybe, no, maybe it's you have to get some binoculars. They should be visible to us. But of course, this is a spiritual realm. They're really there, say all the folklore, but we don't see them anymore. Maybe because we are polluted. Could it be? Maybe too much electricity, too much electric lights at night. Maybe too much smoke, too much noise. Something about our lifestyle has made it impossible for our ordinary vision to catch sight of these devas. But my goodness, you don't have to go back very far in human history to discover times when people and gods were regularly in contact, often at the discretion of the god, right? It wasn't that you could call them up, but they could call us up. And there's lots and lots of, of uh, stories uh, from the past. Edith Hamilton and her mythology is full of the gods on Olympus. Maybe these gods are the very ones they, these devas are said to inhabit a realm on Mount Sumeru, halfway up the polar mountain, Shumishan, and that's where they live. And each of the four gods has a jurisdiction per directions. They have uh, elements, they have colors, they have uh, Dharma instruments. Um, the uh, Dhritarashtra, the country sustainer, is has a musical instrument. He's got a pipa in the Chinese version of it, right? It might be a mandolin, might be a banjo, right? Could be a guitar. It's not a piano because he's standing, but he's he's often depicted holding a stringed instrument. And each of these devas has a realm of demons and nasty uh, spiritual baddies whom they control. In the case of Dhritarashtra, he is Chentapo uh, Chinolo. He is in charge of the Gandharvas. Uh, and that's, they are not particularly evil, but they can be mischievous. They can be hard on humans. And Trigo uh, Tenwa is the one who keeps them in line, okay? In the southern direction, in the south, the king is called Virudaka. That's his Sanskrit name. And he's, his name is the Deva King of Increase, Tsangjang. That's his name, is Increase. And he makes humans wholesome qualities, our good roots grow. Uh, he protects the Buddha Dharma and causes it to increase. And he lives on uh, in Mount Sumeru as well. And his body is green colored. Okay. And uh, he's wearing armor. He looks like a king, right? And he is holding a sword. Now, if you enter pretty much any traditional Buddhist monastery from the Chinese tradition outside at the gate, if just the first structure that you go into will be where the four kings of heaven live. I've been in, uh, I've been in monasteries uh, in China where the, and, and wherever the Chinese Buddha Dharma travels, Taiwan, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Korea, Japan, and uh, Vietnam as well. And, and the devas, the four heavenly kings are just, massive. They're, they're just as huge and pretty intimidating. They're often sculpted with awful features, right? Scowling at you, makes you want to stand up straight, right? Behave yourself, especially his, his uh, jeweled sword, his precious sword. And he is in charge 
of this is Virudaka, the king in Greece. And he's in charge of the Kumbandas and the Buta, the Pishashas, those two kinds of demons. And uh, they're ghosts and demons, and he suppresses them, subdues them. In the West, it is Virupaksha. And Virupaksha means extensive vision, broad vision, big eye, wide eyes, king wide eyes, right? King extensive vision. And uh, he's uh, uh, protects we ordinary folks and uh, lives also on Mount Sumeru. His color is red, he's wearing armor and he is uh, holding, he's subduing a dragon or a snake, depending on how it's depicted. They're not the same, dragons and snakes don't wanna be considered don't want to be confused with each other. Dragons are very upset when you call them snakes, right? Snakes don't want to be dragons. So um, he subdues uh, these uh, animals. We say gods, dragons, and the Eightfold Pantheon. And these are the dragons that King Virupaksha subdues and tames and keeps them in order. And uh, he's also got a pearl in his hand because dragons of their pearls and he separates the dragon from the pearl. And of course the dragon wants the pearl. So that's how he subdues them. And uh, that's his job. And he's in the West. Then in the North is Vaisravana. Vaisravana is called the king of much learning. He's the king of extensive erudition and learning. And uh, um, in Japan, he's Bishamon, is his name. And Vaisravana is a Dovan, Dovan Tim. And uh, he, he, is, he pursues blessings and virtues in the world. And his body is green colored and he's wearing armor. And uh, he's got a, uh, an umbrella, a parasol in his, in his hand. And uh, He's um, the king of heaven. He's the deva whose job is to uh, subdue the ghosts and spirits and their, the harm that they can cause. So often under the feet of this deva, you'll see some twisted, anguished demon being kept in order. By the, by the king, by Sravana. Um, so he is known, Bishamon is known in, in, in India as the god of wealth as well. So Yakshas and Rakshashas are subdued and they follow the, the king Bishamon. So here's, this is, you know, just the, uh, Call it folklore. Yeah, it's folklore, but it's also Dharma lore. And from the Buddha's description, these celestial beings are really, really there. And we humans with our limited uh, binary vision, we, we can't see them, but doesn't mean they're not there. So we have uh, these four devas and their job is to keep order in the world so that the humans who decide to cultivate the way can still find the door open when we get there. So the things like the 10 stages of the Bodhisattva's path are still available when somebody decides that this is their priority. This is what they want to do is cultivate the way. Um, when, you know, I, it's a challenge for people who are scientifically educated and who maybe were completely immersed in STEM, right? Electro, uh, engineering, mathematics, and science and technology, and saw somehow uh, anthropology as a soft course or literature as the refuge of people who couldn't get into engineering programs, right? Um, indeed, 
when the time comes, all of that acquired knowledge based on extending the senses. Science has a lot to do with create, creating a, a device that allows us to see smaller than we can with the eye, a microscope, or further a telescope, right? Extending the senses. But when it comes down to it, when it's time to leave the body or return to our next body, what we discover is there are other eternal verities, eternal truths that really are the boss, that really make the difference, right? The, the fundamental principles that haven't gone anywhere, such as kindness, such as cause and effect. You could say karma, but karma is just one piece of cause and effect. There's also wholesome karma. Good deeds bring good results. Harmful deeds bring harmful results, right? And it has nothing to do with anyone else at all, except ourselves. And at that point, boy, you <laughs> get a scramble. You, you get the Moore's law, right? The periodic table of elements. Uh, Newton's propositions of physics, they're theories, right? But cause and effect and truth of good deeds and evil deeds, those are theories, right? That's the real science. Uh, and we ignore it at our peril. So if you're mom and dad and you've got kids to educate, make sure that you give your kids, that you expose your kids to the old stories, the old stories that go beyond culture. You know, it's not just, this is how they said it in India. And this is how the Buddhists said it. These stories belong to humanity. These are our heritage lessons and we ignore them at our peril. Indeed. Okay. Um, wanted to, we're gonna continue. We're gonna continue next week. We got more, let's take a look here. Um, the Buddha is comprehending, the Bodhisattva is now comprehending all things in the world. And we get a list, what comes up next is those things in the world that exist, right? That the Bodhisattva now knows. He can contemplate them as they are. He can understand things that have not yet been spoken. How's that? He just dips into the, the reservoir of knowledge, of wisdom. It's all available to him now. And uh, there's an analogy to the ocean receiving the dragon's rain uh, compared to what, uh, the, what is, what's going to happen now um, from, you can see for many uh, verses to come. We're, not too many. We're almost done, right? We've got that many to go and then we're over. It's over. Um, what's happening next, next week and the next week and the next week are... Um, tallying of what this what is now available to the bodhisattva inside because he has connected his wisdom um, the things that are now available to know it's kind of like he has been given the key to a library an intense uh, extensive uh, library of all the wisdom available to know right and it's just paragraph after paragraph of quatrain after quatrain, verse after verse of what the Bodhisattva now has available to him or her, right? So pretty amazing, pretty astonishing. I mentioned as we began that this is Master Hua's uh, 26th uh, observance of his nirvana. And it's also Father's Day. I understand not in Australia. I didn't realize that Father's Day was a different date in Australia. But in uh, North America, it's Father's Day. And uh, I wanted to acknowledge uh, both in my life that, that both of the, the, the important uh, male mentors, uh, my father and my spiritual father, uh, share a same day of, of awareness. And uh, things that I got from my teacher uh, I reviewed like uh, 
to our master Jin Chuan uh, last week when we did the lecture at City of 10,000 Buddhas on Sunday night. He wrote a letter and said, thank you to Sherfu. And I uh, did the same. And uh, what I got from my teacher included, uh, I didn't, this is not the, I need, it's plural, right? When you take refuge, you get a Dharma name. When you become a bhikshu, you get a, what called a Wai Ha, that's your sobriquet. So with those names come a whole new awareness of my deeper identity beyond this body. True and real is my, my exhortation to, to uh, tell the truth, to not, ex not exaggerate, to not lie, uh, to be liked or to get benefit. So that was, you know, how priceless is a gift of identity. Um, precepts come from Master Hua. And we look past uh, Master Hua to his preceptor, Master Empty Cloud, and also Chang Ren and Chang Zhi, two other pictures. Master Empty Cloud, they call him Jie Yan Hushan, the source of the precepts. And when you receive the precepts, you have a, a guideline for behavior that takes away the doubts. You don't have to wonder, is this right? Is that right? Is that wrong? Is this... The precepts are from directly from the Buddha. The, the line of moral precepts are traceable back directly without question to the Buddha and to every bhikshu or bhikshuni, layman or laywoman, we transmitted the, the five precepts here yesterday, uh, who has ever stepped into the Buddha's family has received these precepts. So there's a sense of something stable, something unchanging, something uh, reliable and strong and true, right? Life in the Sangha. Then uh, Master Hua's inspiration from his own personal example to cultivate the Dharma. What it's like to have practices in beginning, midstream, and then mature, right? Practices, 10,000, 84,000 Dharma methods, right? New, do one home, we talk about six paramitas and the 10,000 practices. Knowledge of the Tao. Master Hua spoke of the Tao from firsthand knowledge. And he said, Shu Dao, you who cultivate the way, you just knew that it was like air to him in his lungs, in his, you know, carrying his voice to us. That's the Tao. It's just that close, that present. Can't do without it. You can't do without it for even a briefest moment. Uh, giving us knowledge of filiality, showing us what it means to be a filial son. What a gift. That relationship to parents is so rich and deep. I can't imagine not giving that to children. And in the West, we freedom, independence. I want to do what I want to do now. Get out of my way. You can't stop me, right? That's the priority. Not um, what will my actions, how will my actions reflect on those to whom I am related? That thought is comes hard, comes rare in America in, in the 20th century, 21st century. I had gone tired of study. Master Hua with his love of learning rekindled a joy in knowledge in me. Uh, he encouraged me to write, which I would have run right past. Um, he gave me the opportunity to give through being a lens for Dharma, you know, trying my best to polish it so I don't color it, I don't stain it, I don't distort it so that people can find the Dharma through the things that I do. Uh, Master Hua paid for 10 years of my education. Not a thought, just yes. That's, he did that for so many young people. He even had a special bank account in Hong Kong, which uh, he gave to a layperson to administer that was entirely for anonymously paying for tuition for people. Um, 
he introduced me to the Flower Garland Sutra, among others. Who knew? I wouldn't have known. Other monks, teachers don't, who don't emphasize speaking Dharma, right? Uh, so just that, that access to the Tripitaka is just priceless, right? Uh, examples of courage, honesty. He said, I'm not afraid of anything except that I won't be true, said Master Huang. And his, uh, the unspoken part, Shifu gave us just as much, a, as much as we could absorb and a little more, but there was always the feeling that we were, our, our Dharma vessels were tiny and he gave us what we could hold. But if we had bigger Dharma vessels, he could have shared with us the Dharma cloud cloud of dharma that we couldn't hold it there's always that feeling that master hua was a bottomless source an infinite reservoir and would teach you as much as you could learn and then if people say what did he teach uh i was talking with uh hung chao marty the other day and we both agreed that it the shindi the dharma ground the ground of the mind the basis, the garden of the mind, is the hallmark of what Shifu taught that I haven't seen or heard from, from others as much, and uh, other teachers, that, that the idea that the mind, the ground of the mind is where all wholesome sprouts arise, and everybody shares it equally, but we don't tend that mind ground equally, and that what uh, what Shurfu and the Sixth Patriarch. If you want to find out about the Shindi, the mind ground, read the Sixth Patriarch Sutra. Um, read the, the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Shurangama Sutra, the Lotus Sutra, and you'll find this notion of our job is to be good gardeners of the mind ground, grow wholesome sprouts, water them with the water of compassion and kindness and prune them with the precepts and what grows from the mind ground are the blossoms, the fruits, the flowers of wisdom and dharma. So that is um, a heritage that we need to keep, keep alive. Um, so on this day of 26th observance of Master Vasa Nirvana, um, just thinking back on what I gained from him, um, priceless. And my gratitude is a constant every single day. Um, just to mention, here's my father in his uh, Army Air Corps uniform, portrait of him with typical smile. James Francis Clowry. And uh, as I was looking today, I found this uh, photograph, which is, here's my dad kneeling down here on the right, in the front row. Here is his little brother, my Uncle Freeman. Here is his older brother, that's Uncle Don. I don't know why Uncle Don is wearing a bow tie on a hunting party in Quebec. Notice they've got something hanging up behind them. It could be a moose uh, or a bear. As Quebec back then in the 20s and 30s was, had every kind of wild creature. Uh, this is my grandfather who I never knew. I never met him. Uh, and these two gentlemen, I, I don't know who I could ask to find out who they are. And I think they're probably uncles of some sort, but uh, this is my dad with his uh, Winchester 6 30-06 lever action rifle that uh, they're, they're in the snow. These are tough Canadian hunters. Look at, we have down jackets these days. They, they went out in sweaters and bow ties. <laughs> oh man, that's a hunting lodge in Quebec. So that's Father's Day today. Um, I wanted to share a song here, thinking 
about my dad and what kind of music he enjoyed. And Stephen Foster was one. Can I check the tune of that string one more time? There we go. As we pause in life's pleasures, count its many tears, let us all taste the hungers of the poor. There's a song that will linger forever in our ears. Oh, hard times come again no more. Is the song the sigh? The weary hard times, hard times come again no more. Many days you have lingered around my cabin door. Oh, hard times come again. seek mirth and beauty and music bright and gay there are frail forms fainting at the door though their voices are silent their pleading looks will say oh hard times come again no more. here's the song the sigh Day, James Francis Clowry, and I won't say happy Nirvana observance, but certainly it's a time to remember all the goodness that we get from our teachers and elders. And we talk about repaying the Buddha's kindness, repaying parents' kindness, but repaying teachers' kindness is surely 
the proper work of the filial children. All right, um, time now to invite the monks of Berkeley Monastery to let us know what's going on. If we've got any news, what's happening? Hey, I'm Michael Fall. Um, I think probably the main thing to announce is that at the Sit Ten Thousand Buddhas, there's the Avatamsaka Sutra recitation in Chinese, and I believe there's also a link there. You can see that they're reciting. I'm not sure how many times during the day, but a few times I think in English as well. So if people wish to join in, you can go. It's in the cttbusa.org. Cttb. Oh, there it is. Oh, there you go. Perfect. So A, join that. DRBA, DRBA.org. Yeah, so it's, it's DRBA. That's great. Sometimes that doesn't get updated. So yep. Find it at DRBA.org. And for our Berkeley Monastery, we have our regular program in terms of the online ceremonies. We also have, we've been continuing on with our Friday Bowing for India and the, and the entire world um, for the COVID and myriad, um, you could say, disasters or difficulties people are undergoing right now. So if you wish to join us, it's from seven to eight Friday morning. Mm -hmm. So um, you can RSVP and we'll send you a link for all the information. And yeah, I think that's still the main things, programs we have. Um, DRBU, 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 I think still accepting applications or if you want to join the next year, um, please, uh, please look into it. It's a very, um, good chance to continue your education. And they have very I guess, generous in terms of scholarship. So people um, would want to get an uh, education and don't have, you say, funds. The idea is that DRB will support you in making sure you can get a good education. So yeah, there you go. That's where you get some information. Education. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, we have had uh, lots of response to positive response to our Dharma events online and uh, encourage people to discover uh, probably the, the only uh, silver lining in COVID epidemic is how it brought us together uh, online and made possible these uh, the chance to cultivate together before the BBM online happened. We nobody came for morning ceremony. Uh, it was four in the morning, five in the morning. We, you know, downtown Berkeley. No, thank you. So now, uh, how many folks do you have uh, regularly on, at morning chanting now? I think morning we have maybe about maybe 25, 30. Mm. And evening we have maybe about 40 to 50 mm -hmm. at the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because anything that's on uh, Zoom, people from China can join in, which was before that, you know, just unheard of. So, but, but I also think people are joining in afterwards too, because it's actually on YouTube. So people are joining the morning ceremony. You know, people tell us they, they tune in afterwards because of their time zone or, or they just can't get up so early. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Not from China, though. But, yeah, not from China. Yeah. Okay, we have uh, 133 friends who joined us on YouTube and probably in the Vietnamese room, uh, not quite as many. And then the Chinese webcast has got quite a few. Um, I'm here in the Dharma Hall at Gold Coast Dharma Realm because in the Buddha Hall, the Avatamsaka Sutra is being recited. So this week and the next two weeks, we'll be here in the Dharma Hall, which is, there's a brilliant collection of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas here on the altar that my body is blocking your vision of. But uh, this is a fantastic, wonderful hall. And my regular uh, volunteer team, uh, fearless, tireless volunteers, Sam and Cliff and, and Kevin and the others are in the hall next door because this is a smaller room and their translation would, would be overheard on my mic. So. I'm here by myself in the Dharma Hall and we'll be here for two more weeks. Alrighty, okay. So could we please, I'd like to invite everybody to join me uh, in the 
Medicine Buddha's mantra for anointing the crown of the head, which is what we're doing for transference these days, because it sends out a wholesome vibration uh, from the Buddha's own nature and wisdom. I was reading about uh, of all the countries in the world who are suffering with COVID, perhaps Brazil is the one who is this country that will be suffering the most. They're, the uh, government under their leader, Bolsonaro, has done nothing uh, to, to mitigate COVID and is even still denying it in some ways, um, unwisely. And so the, uh, uh, they're, they're thinking there could be yet another spike of COVID uh, deaths in Brazil. So uh, I know some of our friends are on from Sao Paulo right now and just sending them the best and protect yourselves, stay safe any way you can. Um, meanwhile, reciting this mantra is a good way to keep our hearts vibrating properly. So here we go. together and make three half bows. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master, 